Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to this month's AFPHM webinar. Today, we have Dr. Anthony Carpenter presenting on an introduction to health economics. A reminder to all participants that we will have time for questions at the end of the session. So please submit your questions in the Q&A panel and we'll answer them at the end. I'll now hand it over to Dr. Anthony Carpenter. Thanks very much, Terence. And I hope everyone is having a good day. Thanks for joining the webinar. Um, and if you can't hear me or can't see me, please let Terence know through the Q&A panel he's moderating. Um, I'd first like to pay my respect to the traditional owners of the land upon which I'm presenting in Melbourne, um, the Royal Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation and pay my respect to Elders past, present and emerging and to any um, Indigenous members um, of our community online on the webinar today. So <clears throat> the faculty has asked me to give you um, a brief introduction to health economics. They've suggested in terms of the advanced training curriculum, which I remember well from only three years ago, um, that the top three um, training curriculum points would be most relevant for us. So I've covered them today, um, I hope, but I've also suggested some additional training points which um, you might find relevant to our discussion of health economics today. I thought it also useful for us to consider why we're here as a faculty and as registrars and fellows. So what is it that the faculty is actually trying to achieve? Because I think that's relevant to our consideration of our values and that speaks to health economics quite directly. So I found our statement of purpose, which I hadn't looked at for a while. 1.1 um, says that we're committed to achieving the highest levels of health for our populations in Australia and New Zealand. So I think it's important to consider what highest levels means to you and why and how you would measure that. Um, and secondly, that we're pursuing health equity through evidence-based policy and practice. And again, um, it's worth thinking through what you think equity means because that's really a, a core concept of why we do health economics. And there's a link there to the statement of purpose for your interest. So I briefly just wanted to introduce myself and say um, with great respect to my health economics colleagues, I'm not a health economist. I'm just a public health physician and a rural GP who originally did um, an undergraduate and honours degree in economics and finance, studied some health economics as part of my master's of public health, um, and then did some research, for which I was very grateful with the um, team at the Harvard program in healthcare finance. So working with a team of health economists from Harvard and MIT on um, the economic benefit of single payer um, reform in the state of Vermont. So what would their health system look like if we got rid of all the private health insurers? So that's my background. I'm deliberately going to um, cast our introduction in, in what I hope are practical terms for public health physicians. If you want a really serious technical introduction to health econ uh, economics, I can recommend some health economists um, and also some texts and happy to follow up on that um, offline. So I thought it was useful on slide five to um, think about what we're talking about. So what is economics and what is health economics? And I suppose the first concept is that economics is a social science. So we're, we're studying people. And so the measurement of people's preferences and tastes, um, like any survey, um, is inherently subject to measurement bias and measurement error. Um, and that raises all sorts of concerns for validity. Um, economics is fundamentally about trying to allocate scarce resources. So we only have so many people, um, emergency beds, vaccines, um, you name it. So how do we allocate those resources in a way that satisfies the wants and needs of consumers or um, our values as health policy makers? And so health economics is a specialised branch of economics, as you would appreciate. So we're trying to study not only the costs and benefits um, and how we allocate resources, but also inputs, outputs and outcomes of all forms of health care. And you'll note that that definition from the Oxford Dictionary, it says health care at the end of that sentence, not health. And so one of the key concepts I want you to, to leave with today is an appreciation that health care and health system are not the same thing. And I want you to try and think about them differently in terms of health economics. And we'll, we'll go over that in the forthcoming slides. So where did health economics come from? Um, well, the best research I can find about where health, health economics started um, was in the 30s in the United States um, when the uh, American Medical Association started a medical economics bureau. 
After World War II, the US government started the now famous RAND Corporation, which start, uh, stands for Research and Development Corporation, and they um, remain a very powerful force in health economics. Early researchers include the Nobel laureate economist Milton Friedman, who was looking at choice. Why do people choose what they want, a different type of healthcare or a different um, brand of car? And how likely are people to change that preference? So an elasticity of change, um, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with through, um, through public health promotion campaigns, trying to get um, populations and, and cohorts to change their preferences in terms of healthy behaviours. But really the seminal paper, um, I think for health economics is Kenneth Arrow's 1963 paper. There's a link to a 2001 policy um, paper there um, by Arrow. Um, which is readily access accessible through Google Scholar or your, your local search. This is a really boring slide with my apologies. Um, lots of definitions, but these are the core concepts which I think you ought to know about, um, not just for your public health training, but more importantly for your future roles as public health physicians. Um, so I, I don't want to read off the slide, but I think it's worth just touching on um, a couple of the points. In terms of resource allocation, there are two basic ways we can allocate scarce resources, using a market. And a market means um, that um, we match demand and supply by price. So price and ability to pay is the mechanism by which um, we allocate goods using a market. Um, now you can appreciate, I'm sure, that not everyone could afford to, for example, um, pay for coronary artery bypass grafting out of their own savings. So we might choose then to use a non-market mechanism of rationing a good, um, and that's where government gets involved to um, intervene in markets for a social policy outcome, for example. Um, costs can be both direct and indirect. Direct costs are literally what you pay for or the cost of doing a trial. Indirect costs are things like um, if you're sick and can't work, um, in the labour force. So those indirect costs of unemployment, for example, or you need a carer um, to look after you at home. So we should measure those indirect costs when we're doing um, health economic evaluations. Um, benefits and outcomes we'll get to in a minute. Um, the outputs point there, health or health care, um, I'll talk about in a minute. Outcomes, you're probably familiar with um, disability adjusted life years or health adjusted life expectancy. Um, they, they, are, they are key measures in health economics. Um, as increasingly are uh, PROMs and PREMs, um, so patient-related outcome measures um, and patient-related experience measures as we increasingly move towards patient-centred care in our healthcare systems. And lastly, economics is divided into two basic families, macroeconomics, studying the determination of aggregate quantities and microeconomics. When you think microeconomics, I would just think markets. So um, what's the market for vaccines or um, what's the market for um, tobacco consumption in Australia? They would be example of microeconomic questions. So I really like this um, model on slide seven, um, which shows the World Bank's conceptual model of the health system. Um, and the salient point here is that medical care and health services are down the bottom of this um, oval shaped model and that the health system as defined at least by the World Bank um, it is much bigger than that. So you would appreciate readily social determinants of health which are um, often um, far outside the, the, the health system are very relevant determinants of health and so this really matters in terms of health economics, um, uh, in terms of what we're focused on. So if we look at macroeconomics for just a minute, um, here's an example graph from um, the Australian Institute of Health and Welfare, their health expenditure publication in Australia, which shows a top line, a blue line, which is the growth in health expenditure each year as a percentage. The orange line, the bottom line, shows the growth in Australia's gross domestic products um, for each of those years. And you can see that by and large, the blue line, the growth in health expenditure, is above the orange line, meaning that our growth in health expenditure, annual health expenditure, is greater than our growth in the entire economy, which means that we're choosing to spend more and more of our economic resources on health expenditure. That's not necessarily a bad thing, 
but it is a value choice. We could decide not to fund hospital admissions or elective surgeries or new stents or vaccinations or, or what have you. So this macroeconomic slide shows a value choice in the Australian economy. The second picture here on the same slide um, shows what's happened to health expenditure as a percentage of the government's tax revenue. So you can see from about 20% at the start of the graph, the Australian government's now spending about 25, 27% of all tax revenue on health. So we're, we're choosing to spend more as a government. And you'll see that across those years, that's governments of both political persuasions. The third picture shows where we choose to spend um, our money in the Australian health system. And so I was talking about health care and the health system. You'll see the two bars on the left of this graph are hospitals and the primary health care system. You can see that most of our expenditure um, is in formal health care, so hospitals, acute care, um, and in primary health care, so it's both general practice and community and primary care settings, child and maternal health, etc. Not so much on preventive health care. So certainly as a GP, I know that um, a lot of my consults have an element of preventive health care. But by and large, I'm really dealing with patients who present with symptoms or signs of a, um, a recognisable condition. So as a value choice, this graph shows you a lot about where we're choosing to spend our money. Um, and in that hospitals bar chart on the left, which is about $67 million, something like that, you'll see that um, the state and territory local governments spend most of the, the money in hospitals, um, but a lot of that is actually funded by the Commonwealth. So um, that's sort of some brief overviews of what macroeconomic analysis might look like, but I think probably of more interest for us as public health physicians working in departments of health or um, private organisations um, is microeconomic analysis, which is the analysis of markets, or in our case, healthcare markets. And so we're trying to understand cohort or individual behaviour, which is consumption, buying a good, buying a service in response to price and firms or the market's response um, in terms of supply of a good or service in response to price. Um, so why do we not like that and why is that important in terms of health economics? Well, if you're unemployed and trying to get by on New Start or a disability support pension, your ability to purchase healthcare goods and services is inevitably less than um, an investment banker earning hundreds of thousands of dollars a year. So we would, I'm sure most of us agree that that's probably inequitable um, and that, that there's a role for government actions in healthcare markets. And there are only four basic um, actions of governments in, in any market, um, or in our case, healthcare markets. Government can provide the good or service itself. So think public hospitals or um, the national immunization scheme. So we're just, the government is actually gonna provide that. You could subsidise someone else to provide a, um, a service or a good. So um, medicines subsidised by the pharmaceutical benefits scheme um, or Medicare rebate, rebates for medical practitioners. So we'll subsidise the cost of that. The government can regulate um, the um, supply of substances. So heroin is prohibited. Cannabis is prohibited, although um, I understand um, trainees in the ACT that there's legislation to permit the use of, encourage of small amounts of cannabis soon. We can regulate, so you can, an age barrier for smoking or tobacco consumption. A time barrier, so you might have to wait a certain amount of time. So this is a private health insurance example. Um, you know, a qualification period um, to get eligibility for hip or knee surgery, for example, would be um, examples of regulation. So it's not always just government. Or you could tax something. Um, so the example I provided, is trying to tease out the concept of um, consumer responses to a change in price. So um, governments in Lithuania, Poland and, and Finland lowered their taxations on their taxation rate on alcohol. If I had to ask you, did alcohol consumption go up or down because alcohol was cheaper, you'd probably all say, well, um, I bet consumption went up and that's exactly what happened. Um, in Australia, um, we introduced a volumetric taxation scheme, which is to say the higher the alcoholic percentage by volume, the higher the taxation rate. And so it's predicted that that will have a net benefit in terms of reduced alcohol consumption and alcohol-related harm. 
Um, and lastly, um, governments can do other things, can't they, like health promotion campaigns. So um, safe drinking levels, the Grim Reaper campaign for tobacco cessation in the 80s are all examples of um, very effective health promotion campaigns. So if there's this concept of um, us not liking price as a market setting mechanism, what are some other aspects of um, mark, what we call market failure in healthcare and how might that stimulate a role for government? So on this table on slide 10, the left-hand column, conditions for a perfect market, shows the economic conditions that economists define as defining a perfect market, a market where arguably there would be no role for government to intervene. In the right-hand column, healthcare markets are examples of how those conditions are violated. So for example, if we look at perfect information, um, uh, perfect information, um, requires that we know everything that's possible and there's no asymmetry between um, us and healthcare providers. I don't know about you, but if I developed, let's say, um, a vascular condition, even though I'm a GP, I wouldn't necessarily know whether open bypass surgery or an um, endoluminal graft is the right thing. I'd need to see a vascular surgeon and trust their um, opinion. Um, other conditions like no barriers to entry or exit, um, if you were thinking of starting up a hospital, you know you'd probably need a lot of money, lots of buildings and equipment and um, operating theatres and surgeons. So that's plainly not true of healthcare, isn't it? Um, there are significant barriers to entry. Um, and the last one I guess I want to talk about is that the idea that consumers are rational. Rational means economically rational. It's a specific definition of rational. Um, and so there's ample evidence that consumers are not economically rational when it comes to maximizing their, their health, their, um, their longevity of life. And so an often cited example is irrational behavior in, in relation to tobacco use. So I think there was a survey that asked tobacco smokers, did they realize that smoking tobacco was harmful to their health? Yes, they did. Did they expect it to potentially lead to cancer or shorten their life? Yes, I think 80% of them did but those people still chose to smoke anyway. So in terms of strict economics, we would say that that's not rational behavior, um, but people continue to smoke nonetheless. Um, that doesn't mean that they're making an irrational choice for them. It just means that um, it doesn't appear to be economically rational. So that kind of highlights a limitation, I suppose, of economic measurement, where we might not actually understand what, people, what, pe what makes people happy. Um, and we might need to get into behavioural economics to, to understand people's motivations better. Um, moving on to slide 11 um, on the measurement of um, costs and benefit or cost benefit analysis in health economics. I think trainees often, um, and, and colleagues I've studied with for my physician exams, often felt pretty uncertain about um, measurement of, um, of cost, cost benefit analysis. So, um, I've tried to highlight here the three basic measures of cost effectiveness that's used as a, an umbrella term for these three types of um, uh, uh, measures. Um, cost effectiveness analysis is actually a specific type of economic analysis, and it means measuring the difference between monetary costs and monetary benefits. So, Let's say I've got a health promotion campaign to um, increase the rate of breastfeeding um, in my state or territory. And I look at the cost of um, having community health workers go and talk to um, perhaps um, uh, families where they're vulnerable at not continuing breastfeeding. Um, and I'd look at the cost of the intervention and sending out my staff and then look at the monetary benefits in terms of what the best evidence says the likely benefit of breastfeeding for um, the recommended duration is. And I would measure both costs and benefits in terms of money, dollars. And so you'd simply subtract um, costs from benefits and see if you've got a positive number or a negative number. So it would either cost you money or save you money, but there's no measurement of the number of cases or um, you, all you're trying to do is monetize or measure in terms of money, both the costs and the benefits of the program. Um, 
cost-benefit analysis is often seems more intuitive. So again, you're looking at the cost of a program, but you're looking in terms of the outcomes, in terms of the number of events is the way I like to think about it. So how many heart attacks did we prevent? Or in the case of smoking, um, how many heart attacks is smoking responsible for? Um, how many cases of depression um, occur in relation to the program? pneumonia, et cetera. So you're looking at events which we would um, understand clinically um, and epidemiologically as valid measures of outcomes. Cost utility analysis um, looks at the ratio of cost to some measure of utility. And utility is a concept that tries in health economics to measure people's um, ideas of their own health. So the idea is that there's some sort of utility function you might like eating pears, I might like using apples. Your preference for pears would be higher than my preference for pears. So you'd have a different utility function um, in terms of the consumption of pears than I would, for example. So common utility measures I'm sure you've seen in your training and in your work are disability adjusted life years, health adjusted life expectancy but also other health related quality of life measures. So some common instruments, um, which are considered validate, uh, valid in, in certain research terms, the EQ5D in diabetes, you'd all know the K10 in depression, I'm sure. There's the F SF36, the SF12, et cetera, et cetera. So um, what you would do is have the costs of the program on the top line of a fraction, um, the utility in terms of the number of dallies avoided, for example, on the bottom, and you'd look at the cost per dally or the cost per quality achieved from that program. Okay. Um, Terence, you let me know if there's any questions, if, if that's not making sense to anyone, because it's a key point. No problem. No, no questions so far. Reminded, reminded to all participants to please submit your questions through the Q&A panel. Thank you. Thanks, Terence. So in terms of utility, that's complex. So if epidemiologists worry about um, chance bias and confounding um, and selection effects and that sort of stuff, health economists um, worry about um, the validity of how you measure utility, okay? And that, um, uh, one of my um, peers and colleagues at the University of Melbourne is a um, career health economist. And she was telling me the other day, we, we still worry about whether we've got it right. And so how you measure someone's preference and for you guys as trainees, that's important because when you go and look at the impact of a health program, you wanna know that you're measuring the outcome that's right for your program. So you don't present um, an outcome or a cost effectiveness analysis that is invalid. And I'm sure you're familiar with concepts of validity like construct validity, content and criterion validity. Um, so that's an ongoing technical issue. The other thing that happens in health economic valuations is that we often discount qualities and dallies in the future at some annual rate of discount, like 3% per year. So for example, if um, my program prevented a disability adjusted life year next year, and my discount rate was 3%, that one, quality, uh, one disability adjusted life year avoided next year would be worth less than one dally today because I'm going to take the one year in the future, I'm going to multiply it by 0 0.97 to get back to the value of that disability adjusted life year today. And I'll show you a concrete example of that in a second. Um, and it becomes a practical issue about, well, who do you ask? If you're thinking about listing a new type 2 diabetes drug, um, on the market, you know, citagliptin or linagliptin or something like that, do you ask people living with the condition, you know, people living with HIV or hepatitis C, or do you ask the general population how they might feel like if they were living with the condition or not living with the condition? Um, and it really depends on the health policy program, uh, uh, the question of interest. If you're interested in a specific treatment group, most would say, yep, let's ask the people with that condition. If you're interested in a population-wide prevention campaign, perhaps, for example, the Gardasil vac uh, vaccination for HPV, then you might ask the population um, in general. So let's look at a concrete example of um, discount rates on a Commonwealth policy to subsidise um, needle and syringe exchange programs in Australia. And so this is on the Commonwealth Department of Health website. Um, and you can see on the left-hand side um, the discount rate 
So this is analyzing what the effect of different discounts would be on the NPV, that means net present value of qualies gained for HIV, the net present value for hepatitis C and the combined net present value. What net present value means is that you sum up all the future quality adjusted life years from people surviving um, uh, with HIV or with hepatitis C or without those conditions and you discount them back at the discount rate through time. So if you look at the far right of that table, look at the difference in terms of the discount rate, the net present value of quality adjusted life years, 835,000 versus 170,000. So if you're looking at the cost of a program, which presumably has a fixed cost over 10 or 20 years, and then you're dividing it by 835,000 versus 170,000, you're gonna come up with a vastly different cost effectiveness um, uh, analysis or cost utility analysis in this case than you would otherwise. That makes a big difference as to whether that program gets funded. Um, and there's no clear guidelines in the health economic um, literature as to whether you should choose a 0% discount rate or a 5% discount rate. To finish up on this slide, if you choose a 0% discount rate, it's like saying that a year of life in the future is worth exactly the same as a life lived today, a year of life lived today. So you get into this idea of intergenerational equity. I'm sure you've heard um, uh, Ms. Thunberg, the climate change activist, the teenager from um, uh, Scandinavia, um, talking passionately about the value of um, the future environmental state. Well, this is like thinking about, well, what's the value of lives in the future? Um, and so it's a contentious issue um, and, and, not, and one that's often argued in health economic circles. Okay, so that's great. So we've talked about measures of cost effectiveness, cost utility analysis and cost benefit. We've talked a bit about the complexities of measurement on the previous slide. That's great, it's all very abstract. Why don't we get down to brass tacks and think about your training curriculum and use a concrete example from this study in Australia called the Assessing Cost Effectiveness of Prevention Study. This was um, a fantastic study done by um, Theo Boss um, and others who are um, very well known in the public health world. Um, and they looked at what the cost effectiveness of 150 preventive health interventions would be using the best available published evidence um, from around the world. And their conclusions reported strong evidence for, some, for interventions which were cost effective or cost saving preventive interventions. What cost saving means was that by implementing a program, you save money. So it didn't actually cost anything to do versus the alternative. And you actually reduced um, the cost from um, that intervention itself, which is very unusual. It means that you'd be, um, you think hard about why you wouldn't do that. If something was going to actually save you money to implement and was gonna save you money down the track, why wouldn't you do that? It makes no sense um, from a, a technical perspective. Um, and just note that for when we talk about cost effectiveness and thresholds, um, we commonly use a threshold or talk about a threshold of $50,000 per disability adjusted life year. So if a new drug, for example, is sent to the Pharmaceutical Benefits um, Advisory Committee, um, and that committee makes a recommendation on whether it should be subsidized by the PBS, um, then scholars use a benchmark of around $50,000, but that's kept in, in great confidence because you don't want all the drug companies to know that that's your threshold, because oh, they, they just pitch exactly for the threshold. Um, the $46,400 in brackets um, was just from a study which tried to infer based on the market prices of drugs, what the cost effectiveness threshold was um, for the PBAC. So that, that's a, a guesstimate, if you like. So if the ACE prevention study showed that all of these 150 preventive health interventions were so cost saving, the question is, well, why don't we invest more in health prevention? Doesn't that make sense in terms of health economics, and our um, Faculty of Public Health Medicine statement of principles that we favour evidence-based policy and practice. And so it raises the question, as I'm sure many of you experience practically in your jobs, and I have in mine in the Victorian Department of Health, um, 
how does health policy get made? And you all realise, I'm sure, that cost effectiveness and health economics is but one input. And so that term evidence informed policy where health economics and epidemiology are but inputs into a political process. Um, and there's a reference there to the World Health Organization um, webpage on cost effectiveness thresholds in different economic systems. So obviously in a country where the average income level is $1,000 a year, the cost effectiveness threshold is not going to be $50,000 per daily, is it? And that's where um, a lot of the controversy has been about communicable disease, health economics, as I'm sure you know, um, HIV prevention and treatment in um, South Africa, of course, um, and also um, uh, Ebola vaccination in particular. Um, so I wanted to show um, just a, a highlight from the ACE prevention study. There's a great executive summary. It's well worth a read. And this table in the executive summary is a really practical example of how you could use health economics to argue for policy change um, in any system or in any job. So you can see the researchers here on the left on the interventions looked at basic actions by government taxation, regulation, preventive treatments, think um, subsidization through PBS, for example, um, laparoscopic gastric banding surgery, for example, or health promotion. So here are your basic actions of government stacked up against particular drugs or disease conditions, for example. Um, in the DALI's column, you can see that they were arguing that on the, base, on the best available evidence, if you increase the tobacco tax rate to 30%, you'd save 270,000 disability adjusted life years. It would cost you $0.02 billion to implement, but you'd save overall 0.7 or $700 million by doing that. So you can calculate, can't you, the cost benefit analysis. So it'd cost you 200 million, you'd save 700 million, therefore you'd be 500 million ahead, wouldn't you? There's your cost benefit analysis. Cost utility analysis would say, okay, so I'm going to invest um, 200 million, I'm going to prevent 270,000 dallies. So the cost of the program per disability adjusted life year would be 200 million divided by 270,000. Um, my math isn't good after lunch, but you can see that's probably well under $50,000, isn't it? And so um, they argued that these are all cost effective um, interventions. The really interesting stuff comes down here for these three preventive treatments. And that's my area of interest, non-communicable disease prevention. You can see here that if we introduced a poly pill to replace um, current practice, and this is a cardiovascular poly pill containing two um, hypertension lowering agents, um, a statin and low dose aspirin, they, the researchers found that you'd save 60,000 disability adjusted life years, you'd save $7 billion by implementing this and not paying for all the patented individual drugs, which we subsidize through the PPS. And your cost offsets in terms of improved compliance with medication and reduced rates of cardiovascular disease would save you another um, 0.8 billion or $800 million. So the cost benefit would be a saving of $7.8 billion. And you can see you actually get negative cost um, per disability adjusted life year. So a saving per disability adjusted life year. Better still, since the publication of this report in 2010, colleagues at the George Institute in Sydney, Steve Jan, who's the head of health economics there and a, and a fantastic guy, professor at Sydney University, they actually went and did a polypill trial for the secondary prevention of heart attacks, including an over-representation, over-sampling of patients who identified as Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander. And they demonstrated that compliance with cardiovascular medication in a polypill is much better there's 80% compliance, I think, over 18 months versus 50% compliance, taking three or four different pills. So what's really interesting is that um, this is very slow to get into practice in Australia. Again, emphasising the point that it's not just um, evidence that governs policy, that there would be lots of political considerations in here. For example, um, 
potentially loss of job, jobs, research jobs in the pharmaceutical industry in Australia, for example. So um, health economics is just an input into that policy making process. Health technology assessment, um, again, is something which is pretty central to health economics, and I know a lot of trainees are interested in. Um, so HTA, I found a couple of definitions which I think are useful. Um, the World Health Organization's one is first. You can read that, but see that it considers ethical issues um, of a health intervention or health technology. So um, is it right? Is it beneficent? Um, is it non-maleficent? Um, is it fair um, in terms of our, um, our ethical system of um, health policy making? And you might get different answers to that question in different health systems based on your ethical perspectives. Um, the Australian Department of Health um, states that HTA is a range of processes and mechanisms to assess the quality, safety, efficacy, effectiveness, and cost effectiveness of health services. So in terms of this equity question in health economics, the question is really, for whom should we allocate scarce resources and why? So if you just take the attitude, you're a market health economist, that we should just let the market sort it out, the market will ration resources based on price. Okay, so that would be pure market-based um, health economics. No system that I'm aware of in the world does that purely. Um, if you take the view that, well, there are some groups and communities and people who can't afford to pay or they don't have equitable access or they experience discrimination in access or outcomes, then you're arguing for a role for governments or non-governmental organisations to intervene in the market. So that's to subsidise a good or service, some healthcare, um, uh, provide that service directly to consumers. Um, and so really then the essence of health economics is that it's a problem of constrained optimization. You're trying when you develop a program or evaluate a program or um, look at a policy, how can I maximize the outcome of interest, um, prevention of cardiovascular disease amongst the entire Australian community, for example, with a limited budget? And that's the constraint. It's usually a budgetary constraint or a constraint of the number of doctors or nurses or, or what have you. Um, and so um, one practical ethical um, example about health, health economics, which I've had some um, experience of as a healthcare provider, um, is whether the Australian government should pay for access to healthcare for asylum seekers and refugees in Australia. Um, so I would argue, yes, that that's ethically um, appropriate, but that's my ethics. Others might have a different ethical response to that. And you should think about why you think yes or no. So these ethical perspectives here, libertarianism is a rights-based thing. So my right to healthcare, I would argue that refugees and asylum seekers have a right to healthcare. A communitarian perspective might say, well, I'm not really interested in the rights of any individual or group. I'm interested in the average health outcome for the entire population. So then I'd look at the cost effectiveness of providing health care to asylum seekers and refugees, not in terms of their health outcomes, but in terms of the impact of doing that or not doing that for the entire population's health outcomes. That's a very different ethical perspective. One might argue, for example, that elements of the Chinese health system and their insurance program is founded on communitarian principles. Egalitarianism um, is about fairness um, and um, uh, draws in part upon um, social principles. And many scholars would say in health economics that our system is based on egalitarian health economics principles. We could spend weeks talking about bioethics in health economics, but I did want to articulate that this is where health economics really gets into practical implementation. It's not usually about the numbers, but about the values behind the numbers. So if you look on the Australian Government Department of Health's website, you'll see they've got um, rich information about HTA, how it works in terms of the PBS and um, Medicare, Medicare Benefits Scheme and the prosthetic list, um, hips, knees, breast implants, etc. cetera. Um, and also the World Health Organization has really accessible and good resources about HTA if you wanna learn more about this for your fellowship exams or just for your practice. Um, last on 
uh, 4.14, your um, curriculum item, I thought this was useful in terms of um, how difficult it is to get new drugs or new Medicare items listed in Australia. So there's been a program now using health economics to look at low value Medicare items. So Medicare items or services which don't represent a good use of our monetary resources to pay for. Um, and how do we disinvest? So instead of investing in them, how do we remove those items from um, the medical benefits schedule? Um, uh, so we're not paying for stuff and we can use that money for other um, uh, newer technologies. So the Medical Services Advisory Committee, like the Pharmaceutical Benefits Advisory Committee, recommends new Medicare item codes. And that's a really rigorous process based on um, health technology assessment. But it's usually once off. So you've got to work hard to get the item number on there. That's often sponsored by professional societies like um, surgeons or physicians, for example, or drug companies. Um, but once that item is on there, like um, vertebral kyphoplasty was one, we injected cement into collapsed vertebrae, um, and that was found to be of very poor evidence um, and not cost effective, so it was removed. Um, so we're now trying to move to a process where we have an ongoing evaluation of the things which we're paying for out of um, uh, the public purse and whether they're cost effective. Professor Adam Elshorg, who's Professor of Health Economics um, in the Menzies Centre for Health Policy at Sydney, has been um, a real leader in this work in Australia. Um, his MJA article, which is list, uh, shown here, um, was where he and colleagues looked at 150 potentially low value healthcare practices in Australia. And this table shows 13 um, services which they identified as potentially being of low value. And this is where health economics becomes a bit nuanced. If we look at item five, chlamydia screening, I'm sure that our sexual health physician colleagues and most public health physicians would agree that um, chlamydia screening as part of the Australian um, uh, sexually transmissible infection um, guidelines and practice is um, a worthwhile thing to do. And so, Adam and colleagues weren't saying that we shouldn't screen for chlamydia. What he was saying was that there's not good cost effectiveness evidence to screen everyone for chlamydia. We should probably focus our screening on people and, and cohorts who are identified using evidence-based um, uh, um, scores of being at high risk of having asymptomatic chlamydia. So, it's not that it's an either or situation. It's trying to, again, think about constrained optimization. How do we make best use of the money we've got to maximize health for high risk groups or the entire Australian population, for example? Um, and another one there's um, got good evidence behind it, imaging in um, low back pain. So number seven. So again, the George Institute has done really good um, uh, research on this that for patients who present with low back pain without any yellow or red flags, there's really no role for um, uh, um, spinal imaging. Um, it's not a cost effective practice and we sh probably shouldn't um, pay for that imaging out of the public purse. Um, so I hope that makes sense in terms of um, disinvestment, which is an important aspect of health economics. And if anyone uh, mentioned that to me in the exam, I'd be really um, pleased to hear that they'd thought about that aspect of health economics. And I'm not an examiner, by the way. Um, so moving on just at the end of our presentation for the last five minutes, um, the other two um, uh, curriculum objectives the faculty asked me to address, they're both level one objectives. So you don't have to be able to do these as trainees. You just have, these are the ones you just have to have awareness of. Um, so strategic and business planning. Strategic planning is um, you know, global planning for an organisation or um, Department of Health, for example, um, and that's defined as a process of defining strategy, um, broad direction of an organisation, and also making decisions, you'll see again, on allocating resources. So we've got a limited budget from um, the government, for example, to run our health department for this year. What are we going to do with that? How do we prioritise that? Do we just look at um, cost effectiveness thresholds and we don't worry about the nature of the conditions themselves. If we just did straight out CUA analysis across all health conditions, 
the allocation of our resources would look very different than the way in which we allocate resources at the moment. So clearly there are values, politics, egalitarianism, ethics, going into that process of how we um, uh, allocate resources. Business plans are um, typically smaller. So a business plan is usually for a business unit or a specific program that you're planning or evaluating. Um, and it says, you know, contains the, the, the goals of that program, methods, um, human resources, money, capital, um, equipment, etc., and the time frame. Um, and so, for example, I'm involved in a chronic um, disease hospital admission um, uh, reduction program called Health Links in Victoria at the moment. Um, so we've got a, we're working on a business plan at that at the moment to try and get that approved. Here's an example of the Commonwealth National Strategic Framework for Chronic Conditions. So that's a um, strategic planning document. Um, and I can't show you the Health Links business plan, but there are many business plans out there um, which you'll have internally or externally. Finally, um, 6.3.5, managing budgets. I think that's actually a really key skill that you should all learn. I know it's only level one and probably not a focus of your exam prep, but understanding how to put budgets together and particularly how to interrogate budgets. So if you've ever been to meetings where a chief financial officer or um, another senior colleague will present a budget and the numbers all look black and white and you think, oh, that's fine and, and it often doesn't get scrutinised, I'd really encourage you not to be afraid. Um, as someone who has trained and worked in finance for 20 years, apply your public health smarts, your logic, ask where the evidence comes from. You know, where did that number come from? How certain are we? Is there a range of confidence we have around that? Why aren't I seeing that, et cetera? Um, so don't feel that if you haven't had finance training, you can't inter interrogate budgets in health programs because you really know a lot from your training in epidemiology and biostats and health promotion. Um, so, so do speak up and it's often the questions you're thinking of that you don't ask because you're afraid of you know, not sounding smart or whatever, that are the really perceptive and helpful questions and might actually strengthen a business case and improve a, um, the outcome of a program. In terms of managing budgets, um, if you're developing a budget, find previous budgets, obviously, if they're available, figure out what's different um, now versus then. So are there organisational differences? So in public health departments, you might have an efficiency dividend because there's lower government revenue. Is the environment different? So um, have public attitudes changed? Um, is it harder to identify cases, um, et cetera? Um, and try and use some method of forecasting. So use available evidence. So what's gonna to happen to costs over the life of my program? Are there likely to be annual increase in labor costs, for example, which are already baked in? Um, or is there some technological innovation that might affect the cost of your program? Um, lastly, budget management. When you've got a budget and you've got a program up and rolling, just expect and prepare for shocks or changes to your budget. That's just normal, as, as you probably appreciate. And try and perform a what if analysis when you're looking at the components of your budget. So, um, for example, um, if you had critical people or critical um, access to um, supplies like vaccines, for example, and they went away, think to yourself, well, what would we do? Is there an alternative supplier? Is there a risk mitigation strategy we can apply and still achieve the objective? Um, and think about a business continuity plan. So in the media reporting at the moment, a number of Victorian hospitals have reportedly had their information technology systems um, hacked by um, uh, external um, hackers. Uh, it's a really serious um, business continuity issue. And so those health services have enacted business continuity plans so they can continue to provide health services. So that's a, a really serious example of where um, you need to think hard about um, budgets and program plans. And obviously talk to other people who've done it before. So in summary, um, we've had a look at those three um, advanced training curriculum um, points. Um, I'd remind you that health economics is a social science and like epidemiology is subject to all sorts of um, measurement issues, um, confounding chance and bias. So don't just take the numbers at face value, do ask questions. And I think that's it, Terence. Yep. Thanks very much everyone for attending. If there are any questions, I'm happy to take them now. Thank you. If anyone has any questions, can you please type them into the Q&A pane and we'll answer these now. Thank you.
conscious that health economics is not everyone's interest, um, my email is on the slide. If you've got questions, you're welcome to follow up. So our first question, just querying the slide outlining types of health economic evaluation, I, as, I understand, as I understand it, cost benefit analysis is the difference between monetary costs and monetary benefits, whereas CEA is the ratio of cost to health events slash outcomes. Uh, yeah, you're, um, you're absolutely right. They're back to front. I'm so sorry. Um, so thank you for your perceptive question and my apologies. Um, so um, cost benefit analysis, point one, should have this text here in point three, um, attached against its definition and cost effectiveness analysis in point three here should have this text attached to it down here. Does that answer your question? Does that make sense? So we have a question. Is it correct that the PBAC process only considers direct costs, not indirect costs? What effect does this have on public health interventions, uh, e.g. Yeah. vaccines? Yeah, so it's an excellent question. So they consider incremental costs. Um, so um, if the current cost and um, evidence for an existing product is there, and you're looking to list a superior product. And often health economists in the big pharma companies often um, conduct superiority head-to-head -head randomized control trials. And you'll see this in the journals all the time. Um, so a new class of statin or um, a new class of hypoglycemic agent. And so they'll look at the existing drug and its approved indications on the PBS. And then they'll target that national committee, in our case, the PBAC, with an incremental analysis saying, we have a lower cost for the same quality adjusted life year or effectiveness than the existing medicine that's listed, or for um, uh, um, an equivalent um, uh, outcome, quality adjusted life years, for example, or, or you know, reduction in A1Cs or, or whatever, we have a lower cost. So it's an incremental, um, analysis against the uh, medicine that's already been approved. And what's really interesting when you go, as I have, to the International Society for Pharmacoeconomic Outcomes Research, which is the big research body for academic health economists and industry health economists in pharma, is that they have a very sophisticated international analysis of the PBAC and its equivalent committees around all of the OECD countries. And they look for opportunities, if I could put that positively, to get medicines listed under different national formularies and try and build a basis in, in health economics to get their medicines listed. In terms of indirect costs, no, you're quite right. Um, uh, that um, uh, process would not, as I understand it, um, routinely look at indirect costs like um, labour force participation, for example, if someone's diabetes is stabilised and they're able to work and then pay taxes, et cetera, that that wouldn't um, uh, be part of the um, PBAC process. That's a good question in terms of um, 
influence on public health outcomes. And I'd have to think um, a little bit about that. Um, if, if you included indirect costs and you had a positive intervention, which looked cost effective by a cost utility analysis threshold, for example, and it had a positive spillover effect, for example, labour force participation, and you counted that indirect cost, then that would probably um, make the listing or the subsidisation of that pharmaceutical more attractive to your committee, wouldn't it? It wouldn't make it less attractive. If there was a negative spillover effect and you included the indirect cost, it would probably make your cost utility analysis threshold look higher and you'd be less likely to subsidise that. The best example I can think of where that has probably played a role is in France where their national formulary um, uh, makes cost free, so no pharmaceutical benefits monthly fee, um, concessional or non-concessional. They make those 30 medicines for those 33 conditions free at the point of care and it's cardiovascular prevention drugs and, and diabetes drugs. Because they want to encourage people with those conditions to maintain their conditions under good control and arguably then be productive members of society in whatever way, um, shape or form they choose. So that's an interesting potential applied international difference of where um, different pharmaceutical committees have taken different views on what to subsidise and what to list and why. But I thank you for the question. And if I haven't answered it, um, please follow up with me through email. Thank you. We'll give it maybe one more minute for any last questions. Otherwise, we'll wrap it up. Well, I think that's it. A very big thank you to Dr. Anthony Carpenter for coming in to do a wonderful presentation. I think that concludes today's webinar and we hope to see you next time. Great, thanks all. Thanks very much, Terence. Thank you.